you don't need our permission. You're not selling anything from it. And I said, can I please have your permission anyway? And the secretary or reception has given me your permission. So we're good with the title. And we, have, we definitely have some of his material in here. I'm indebted to uh, Josh McDowell, evidence that demands a verdict. But primarily, uh, not necessarily tonight, but as we get into how the Bible was developed, uh, very indebted to an author uh, named F.F. F. Bruce. He wrote a number of books about, he's a new, he was a New Testament scholar. He wrote a number of books about the Bible, and um, we're going to see a lot of his stuff in our, in, our, in our study. So, why I believe the Bible and why you should too. When I first became a believer, I, remember, I was in Teen Challenge in San Diego, and I remember singing a song that contained the words, The Lord is my banner. I didn't understand it. So I asked our interns what that was all about. Well, it was explained to me how the banner was used in military battles to help guide the soldiers. So as they're in their battles and, and they're in heated battle with the other side, the opponent, the banner would tell them, first off, where their captain was or where their king was. And second, that banner would tell them when to advance and when to retreat. Okay, they don't have little radios in their head communicating like everybody does now. So if they looked over and they saw the banner and that banner is moving in that direction, they're moving in that direction. And if the banner is moving back, coming towards them, they need to back up. So wherever that banner went, that was a direction, told them the direction in which they needed to go. I personalized that idea and I made it my own. See, for most of my life at that point, I, had, I really had no moral standard. I was not raised in a Christian home. I was raised in a good home to some degree, uh, but certainly not Christian. Oftentimes we hear the term that someone has no moral compass, right? They don't have any way of telling them true north. That was Bob. Uh, I made moral and ethical decisions on the fly. Okay. When I was faced with a moral challenge, I sought the solution that best suited my needs and my desires at the moment. But when I began seeing the Lord and His Word as my banner, things changed. And I, I remember thinking specifically that I now have a standard. I now have something that in the midst of the battles of life I can look to and it will say go this way advance keep moving or it will say you're going the wrong way you need to stop turn around Carol um, <clears throat> so those decisions before that were made based on what's good for Bob, at least what I thought was good for Bob, were, were now not made so subjective. Those de decisions were now governed by the Word of God. The direction was marked out for me in advance. So even before I began, I could learn things about which way to go. All I had to do in the midst of a struggle was look up see which way to go, just like those soldiers. The banner indicated to advance, I would advance. If the banner indicated to go the other direction, I retreated. The Word of God was now my standard, my banner. As an addict, see, it had become my practice to make up the truth as I went along. I had no moral compass. I made decisions on the fly as best I could. <clears throat> and I would often manipulate the truth to suit the need of the moment. Once I found that security in the Word of God, all that changed. I learned a new definition of truth. That definition has given me a stability. 
that I enjoy to this day. Truth, I learned, is, is not relative to the situation. It's not something to manipulate to suit the need of the moment. <coughs> to define truth, consider this. First off, dictionary.com defines truth as the true or actual state of a matter. Conformity with fact and reality. To be sure that we have the truth, though, we need to know all the facts and all the variables. <coughs> Otherwise, we only know a portion of the truth. Only God can consider all variables and all the facts and be objective. Therefore, I propose this definition of truth. That truth is God's perspective on any matter. <coughs> On any matter, truth is God's perspective. No matter what it is. Are you speeding? Well, what would the Lord say? Well, culture says I can do this. The speed limit says I can do that. All right. What would God say about that? It is, is it okay for a Christian to cheat on their taxes? You know the government's corrupt anyway. They're all evil anyway. I don't know. What's the word of God say about that? So no matter what situation we are in, <coughs> there is truth. And it is cemented in. And it doesn't move and it doesn't change. Truth is God's perspective on any matter. We live in a culture that tells us that this is not true. We live in a culture that embraces relativism. We even have a term for it. My truth. It's my perspective that matters. Not yours. Not God's. Mine. You see, in that, I've become my own God. We need to flee from that, that thought process. Those standards are dangerous and most likely will result in confusion and ultimately destruction. That's what it did for me. Contrary to popular belief, we do not have to live according to present culture. We don't have to accept moral relativism, situational ethics. We don't have to live making important moral and ethical decisions by the seat of our pants. We don't have to find our own moral standards or our own version of the truth. See, God has entered in and He has given us His Word. God has given us His perspective. There are principles that we will find in Scripture that give us clear guidelines. There are areas that we would consider gray areas, but there's still guidelines that will guide us through that. And the better we know God and the better we know His Word, the better equipped we will be to make the right decisions. God has done this. He has given us His perspective in such a way that it endures. He had it written down and passed on he gave us the Bible. Isaiah 40, verse 8 says, The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Yeah. yeah. Times change. Cultures change. Fashions change. I remember those wide bell bottoms. <laughs> now they're really wide ones. The wider they were, the cooler they were, right? We could hardly walk in them. Uh, <laughs> Then there were skinny ones, and then there were, yeah, anyway. Uh, <laughs> even nations come and go, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Generations come and go, political powers rise and fall, but the word of our God will stand forever. For us to find the security in God's word and to be able to make decisions According to God's word and to stick to them 
even when it looks like things aren't going our way, even when it looks like it's going to be more difficult because of those decisions, to be able to stick to those decisions, we need to have an absolute trust in this and not believe that it contains the Word of God in places, but that it is the Word of God and it's been faithfully transmitted over the years down to us today. That's the goal of our study is to dig into those things and find those things. We must know that the book that we look to for answers isn't the product of man's own doing. We need to know and understand that the Bible has an origin outside of our world. And that when we follow it, it will guide us to a known end. That is our hope. Paul called that the blessed hope, the known end. We do these things, we know our end. So that's the primary purpose of our study, to give us trust in our Bibles that we can stake our lives on. Our study of the Bible will begin with reviewing the available evidence that our Bibles are, in fact, the Word of God. I want to say up front that this is going to be a learning study, more than a life application study. So it's going to be a little different. Due to the nature of the study, we're going to see and hear some words from time to time that may be new to us. Please don't be put off by this. I've had some people struggle with that in the past in our studies. But it's necessary to use these terms, to understand these terms, to really drive home these concepts. I want to save our general Bible questions for the question and answer session that we're going to have at the end. I'm trying to put together a panel, Pastor Joe, Pastor Chris, maybe Pastor Sandy, some of the senior pastors here, uh, people that have been in the Word of God for a long time. I want to put together a panel to answer our questions. I'm not sure who's all going to be in that yet. They haven't all committed. Uh, and I want to save our general Bible questions for that time. But if you have a question, if you don't understand something, if a term I've used isn't making sense, raise your hand. We, we want to deal with it then and there. We want to make sure that we understand. See, the worst thing for me is to have spent all these hours putting this together and having a great desire for all of us to come up together in this and to leave some behind because you didn't understand this, and there was a concept that was based on that, and we built on that, and you didn't understand the, bis the basis, so once we got another half an hour into it, you were completely lost. So if you get to that point, please raise your hand. So we're going to begin our evidence of the Bible by using a well-accepted technique called histio historyography. They're new to me, too. Histi historiography, okay? Histi historiography, easy enough for me to say. Uh, C.S. Sanders in, in Introduction to Research in English Literary History explains the three basic principles of historiography. See, the stuff that the, the literary, the, the methods that we're using aren't unique, oh, we only use those for, for the Bible. No, these methods are, are for literature. Okay? These are standards that all men in these areas accept. They're not something that's specific that other people go, oh, sh that's what you guys made up. No, we're, we're going to use what the world uses as they look at documents, as they look at literature. So first off, there's the bibliographical test. Then there's the internal evidence test and an external evidence test. The bibliographical test is an examination of the textual transmission by which the documents reach us. That is, how did the original document 
that Paul wrote to the Romans become the book of Romans? We're going to study. Not tonight, we're not going to get to that, but we will get to that. How did these particular things that were written pass down through the ages and get into our Bible? So in other words, not having the original documents, not having the actual document that was written in, by Paul or by his amanuensis, the person like a, like a secretary would be writing for him, uh, not having that, we need to know how reliable are the copies that we have in regard to, one, the number of manuscripts. Okay, so a manuscript is a document, it's a copy of the original or a copy of another copy. And it would be typically on Originally, they were on vellum or animal skins back in for the Old Testament. New Testament, they were on papyri. They were on. They took the reeds uh, and and the reeds. They would peel them apart, lay them flat, dry them out, put them together. Made sort of a, a paper. And then they would roll them up, and they became scrolls. Okay. So, how many of those do we have? <laughs> Honey, you, you can't be doing that in our class, Mihai. Yeah. Okay, if you can't control yourself, you're going to have to step out. Um, so how many of those do we have? And then what is the time interval between the ones that we have and the ones that were, and the original writing? So say Paul wrote uh, 1 Thessalonians, let's just say in AD 47. Okay, the oldest, I don't know, I haven't done that research yet, but the oldest manuscript, let's just say that we had, was A.D. 200. So we would say then, there's 153 years difference between the writing and the oldest manuscript. That is one of the methods that is widely accepted for judging the authenticity and the authority of all ancient manuscripts. How many do we have and the age? between the time it was written and the date of the manuscript that we do have. Internal evidence. We'll look at internal evidence as well. That'll be actually the last thing that we look at. That is, what does the Bible have to say about itself? The Bible has a lot to say about itself. We'll look at that, for me, will be, the, I think, the most fun. I love getting in and digging into that stuff. Uh, and the final thing, however, is the first thing that we're going to look at is external evidence. And that is, what are the things that are outside the Bible that show us that its source is from outside time and space, that it has a supernatural author? At the end of the external evidence, and tonight, we will, act, we will be able to get into the bibliographical evidence. And as I've not ever studied from notes, I wasn't sure how many to bring. I, I don't have a whole lot left, so I'm sure we're going to get through it. Um, but that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to look at external evidence, some of it, and we're going to look at the bibliographical evidence. <coughs> you did bring those copies? Yes. Um, all right, let's dig in. Then, oh, then at the very end, Again, we're we'll digging into the scripture and see what it has to say about itself. Hey, Bob, what yes. was external again? External is, is the things outside the Bible that show us its source. Thank you. So first off, external evidence. The Bible is supreme among the world's literature. Among all the literature ever, the Bible is supreme. It's supreme in its circulation, it's supreme in its influence, and it's supreme in its survival against attack. That sheet that Carol's handing out will be for the for right near the end. Okay? So you can you can take a look at it, but, but we don't need to really look at it in depth until we get to the end. 
The Bible is supreme in its circulation. The Bible is the best-selling book of all time, hands down, no competition. You've all heard of the New York Times bestseller list? All right. Well, I did a little research, and I found out that to ensure a spot on the New York Times bestseller list, oh, there's all these web pages, and you can pay people money, they'll tell you how to get your book onto the bestsellers list. The New York Times bestsellers list, because apparently there's quite a few of them. Um, but the, the, a number of them that I looked at, one thing they had in common, they said you need to sell about 9,000 copies the very first week that your book is out. Okay, and I didn't, they never said how many you needed to sell continuing after that, but I'll just, I just took that number and said, you know what, let's stick with that. 9,000 copies the first week and every week thereafter. Fair? All right. So if we use the New York Times bestseller list as our standard, and we know that we would need to sell or produce and distribute about 9,000 Bibles every week since its inception, we can do the math. So rather than going to the mid-fourth century, which we will learn is about the time the Bible came together in the form that we know it right now. Okay, that was mid fourth century, about 327, I think, AD. Um, rather than starting there, we're going to go back to year one. So, so we'll have a little bit. We'll need a little bit more Bibles being distributed to make that number. But we're going to go to year one because it was easier for me to do that that way. So, to be on the New York bestseller list, we need to sell or distribute 9,000 Bibles a week. If we had done that since year one. We would have placed nine million, no, excuse me, nine hundred and forty-seven million sixteen thousand Bibles. We would have placed nine hundred forty-seven thousand nine hundred forty-seven million sixteen thousand Bibles. So, nearly a billion, nearly a billion Bibles would have needed to been distributed. However, we're at just over six times that number. Imagine that. Yeah. That's right. The Bible has about six million copies since its inception. The Bible is the best-selling, most widely distributed book of all times. The Bible is supreme in its influence. The Bible has many well-known sayings in society. Sayings like, all things to all men, the blind leading the blind, can a leopard change his spots, fly in the ointment, drop in the bucket, the handwriting on the wall, and on and on. All these phrases and many more are used around the world nearly every day, have been for many, many years, I suspect that most of the people that use those phrases have no idea that they're quoting the Bible. The Bible is the most shoplifted book in the world. <laughs> Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Right? <laughs> Except for the Bible. Yeah. The, Bi the whole Bible, the entire Bible, is available in the 426 languages. The New Testament is, a bit, is available in 1,115 languages. Portions of the Bible are published in 2,500 of the world's 7,000 languages, resulting in 90% of the people on earth having the Bible available in their own language. There's still a lot of languages that it's not available in, but there's very few people that speak those languages. So 90% of the people on the planet have the Bible, or a portion of it, I guarantee it's the book of John and Psalms, available in their own language. No other holy book even comes close. Yes, ma'am? What is the original language? The original language of the Old Testament is primarily Hebrew, 
There's um, some portions that were written in Aramaic, and the New Testament is Koine Greek. It's the common Greek of the day. We had Classical Greek and Koine Greek. The Bible was written in that common Koine Greek. The New Testament was. The Bible is supreme in its influence. More books have been written about the Bible than all other religious books combined. Bible scholar Bernard Ram, and i got to read just a little bit, on the Bible influence says this, from the Apostolic Fathers dating from A.D. 95 to modern times is one great literary river inspired by the Bible. Bible dictionaries, Bible encyclopedias, Bible lexicons, Bible atlases, Bible geographies. These may be taken as a starter. Then at random, we may mention vast bibliographies around theology, religious education, hymnology, missions, biblical language, church history, religious biography, devotional works, commentaries, philosophy of religion, evidences, apologetics, and on and on. There seems to be an endless number. Again, from the dating of the Apostolic Fathers around AD 95 to modern times, there is a great literary river of books that have been written and inspired by the Bible. No other book of any sort comes close. Who here has heard of the Gutenberg movable type printing press? Anybody? I'm in the copier business, so that, that stuff, you know, I'm down with it. Johannes Gutenberg, who developed the movable type printing press, developed it to print Bibles. Yeah. So that he could make them affordable for the common man. At that time, the Catholic Church had a lock on the Word of God. At that time, they controlled the translation of the Bible. They did not want the Bible in the language of common people. They said that it was dangerous. You wouldn't understand it. So it was only available in Latin. And at that time, Latin was only known by a few. But men like Martin Luther, uh, Tyndale, Wittenberg translated the Bible into the languages of the day, and men like Gutenberg printed them up. And many of those men gave their life for it. The Catholic Church hunted them down and burned them at the stake because they said, what you are doing is against God. It's not okay for people to read it for themselves. The Bible stands alone in its supremacy among literary works and holy books of the world. Now this above doesn't prove the Bible is true, but it proves to me that the Bible is unique, that it's different from all others, that it has no like or no equal. A professor remarked, if you are an intelligent person, you will read the one book that has drawn more attention than any other, mm -hmm. if you are searching for the truth. Many of our pe people of our time are quick to dismiss the Bible without giving it a second thought. But does that really make sense? Just looking at how the rest of mankind, let's just say in the last 500 years, has responded to this book ought to make any thinking person take the time at least once in their 50, 60, 70 years on this planet, take the time at least once to read the greatest book ever written. It just wouldn't make sense to pass that up. I mean, I read great, not great, but the common books of literature because I didn't pay attention in high school. 
So I've gone back and I've read some of those. The uh, oh, Fahrenheit 451 was one. Uh, Great Gatsby, right? I didn't get those in high school because I was a derelict. So as an adult, I went back and read those, right? And if you would go back and read that kind of stuff, wouldn't you read something like this that has changed the world? I mean, Christ had such an impact on this earth that we changed our calendar. We reckon what day it is every single day, right? They would say, it's 2018 in the year of our Lord. Now, in modern culture, we drop off the year of our Lord, but we still hold that numbering sequence. The Bible is preeminent in its influence. The Bible has also been preserved against attack, and I believe supernaturally. Originally written on material that perishes, having to be copied and recopied for hundreds of years, before the invention of the printing press, the Bible did not diminish its style, correctness, or existence. So those, the, the media that they wrote on would dry up. The ink would be, you couldn't see it, depending on what type of media they were writing on. So at a certain point, we needed to copy that over or lose it forever. That's the reason that we don't have so many of the old non biblical writings. And we're going to get into that. You have that chart in front of you. The reason we don't have more and more copies of those is because they wore out. And people didn't think that those were important enough to make copies of. Because you don't write, what is that, a couple thousand pages? You don't copy a couple of thousand pages because it was interesting. <laughs> right? You do it because it's, it's sacred. It's the word of God. The Bible compared with other ancient writings has more manuscript evidence than any ten pieces of classical literature combined. A.T. Robertson, author of the most comprehensive grammar on New Testament Greek, wrote this. There are some 8,000 manuscripts of the Latin Vulgate, at least 1,000 of other early versions, over 4,000 Greek manuscripts, at the time of this we wrote, now we've got over 5,600 of them. And we have over 13,000 copies or portions of the New Testament. Besides all this, much of the New Testament can be reproduced from the quotations of early Christian writers. Imagine that. The Bible has been quoted so many times that they, if they were to take all the Bibles in the world and destroy them, we could recreate the Bible from other people quoting it in various books. That's supremacy among the literatures of the world. The Bible has withstood vicious attacks from its enemies as no other book. Many have tried to burn it, ban it, outlaw it from the days of the Roman empires, to the present-day communist-dominated countries. Sidney Collette, in All About the Bible, says, Voltaire, the noted French infidel who died in 1778, said that in 100 years from his time, that Christianity would be swept from existence and passed into history. But what happened? Voltaire passed into history. <laughs> While the circulation of the Bible continues to increase in almost all parts of the world, carrying blessing wherever it goes. For example, the English cathedral in Zanzibar is built on the old site of a slave trade market. And the communion table stands on the very spot where the whipping post once was. Was placed. The Word of God has displaced the darkness. The world abounds with such instances. As one has truly said, we might as well put our shoulder to the burning wheel of the sun and try to stop it on its flaming course as to attempt to stop the circulation of the Bible. Think about that. We might as well put our shoulder to the sun and try to stop it from rotating 
as to stop the Bible. Irony of all ironies, roughly 50 years after Voltaire's death, the Geneva Bible Society purchased his home in Switzerland and began printing Bibles on the very same press that Voltaire used to print his anti-Christian propaganda. Talk about irony. <laughs> the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. So how do we know that the English Bible we have today is a faithful rendition of the original writing. Well, for this, we use the same method used to de determine the authenticity of any ancient document. That is, we will use the process called bibliography. How many ancient manuscripts do we have? How close are they to the original writings? Now let's take a look at our chart. Ah, I left something out. That very first line that says Caesar up there, that should have been his uh, history of the wars. What's it called? I, can't think of it. I didn't study all these books. <laughs> some, some of you may have. Uh, so this shows a number of ancient literature that are popular. Plato. Plato is taught in high schools and colleges all over the United States. Have you ever heard of anybody questioning whether we in fact had the words of Plato or the words of Socrates? Socrates we don't have anything that he wrote. Anything. But nobody considers whether or not the things that are attributed to him were actually said by him. Tacitus, Roman uh, historian, AD 100, third line down. Okay. His, his Roman annals is widely accepted as the authoritative Roman history book. The earliest document that we have is dated A.D. 1100. It's a thousand years from the time of its writing. And we have a whopping 20 of those manuscripts. And nobody, not a single person questions, is this really the words of Tacitus? Or is somebody just making this up? Pliny the Younger, in his books on history, Oh, Thucydides, you know. Herodotus, 480 to 425 BC, 1300 years from the time he wrote, we have eight manuscripts. And these aren't some obscure documents. These are the most tested documents in, of ancient literature. This is just some stuff that we pulled out, but well, there's hardly any of these. Let's use those for comparison. Well, these are the ones that, that the world looks to to find out what happened back then. Euripides, Demosthenes, Aristotle. Look at Aristotle. Written roughly 322 BC. The earliest copy, 1100 AD. 1400 years, five manuscripts. Nobody questions whether we have the words of Aristotle. Now drop down to the last line. I'm not making this up, guys. I'm not. This is real. This is real. This, these documents, these 5,600 copies that we have of the New Testament are what are used to give us this. That's why I can rely on this. I can stake my life on this. Because this is real. It's not once upon a time in a land far, far away. These things happened in time and in space, in history. Yes, it was a long time ago. 
but we can follow those documents through. So the New Testament, written from approximately 47 AD to 95 AD. The earliest extant copy of a manuscript we have is roughly, at this time, of the, was 130 AD. We actually now have a document, a portion of the book of Mark, from the first century. We have a portion of the book of Mark that was, it's a copy within 30 years of the time it was written. 30 years, look at the rest of these documents. 1,300 years, 1,500 years, 1,300 years, 700 years, 1,000 years. No, 30 years. But who can believe the Bible? It's just a bunch of stories. Yeah. Suffice it to say that the Bible is supreme among the world's literature. We don't hear much of it in our day, but in years past, a major slam against God's word was that there were many places and people groups that are just made up. These things never existed. But then came archaeology. And time after time, the Bible has been proven correct. There were many for a long time that denied Moses as the author of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. There are still those today that ignorantly do that because they, they're just not aware of, of uh, current scholarship. The idea that Moses did not write the Pentateuch, a theory known as documentary, excuse me, the documentary hypothesis. That is that there were a number of people that had their hand in this writing and that it was years and years and years after the event. Okay? That has been thrown into the faces of Christians for more than two centuries. And yet amazingly, one of the first assumptions upon which this theory rests was, was disproved long ago. But people aren't aware of modern scholarship. From the earliest period of the development of the documentary hypothesis, it was assumed, the secular scholars of the day assumed that Moses lived in a time prior to the knowledge of writing. That we didn't have the ability to write. How could he have written it? And so, professor after professor has ridiculed our college students, Moses, the Pentateuch. They didn't even have writing back then. Okay? One of the founding fathers of the documentary, documentary hypothesis, Julius Wellhausen, was convinced that ancient Israel was certainly not without God-given basis for ordering of human life, only they were not fixed in writing. He, so he believes that, yeah, they had God-given ordinances but they had no way of writing it down. There was no writing back then. Just a few years later, Hermann Schultz declared, of the legendary character of the pre-Mosaic narrators, the time of which they treat as sufficient proof. It was a time prior to the knowledge of all writing. So these scholars, one after the other, swore there was no writing. These suppositions certainly had an impact on these men's belief and of the promotion of the theory that Moses could not have written the first five books of the Old Testament. One major problem with the documentary hypothesis is that we now know that Moses did not live in a time prior to all knowledge of writing. In fact, he lived long after the art of writing was already known. A veritable plethora, this is not my words, you, when you hear me saying things like that, you know, I didn't write that. <laughs> uh, this is a research paper, not a regular study, right? A veritable plethora of archaeological, yeah, let's try that again. A veritable plethora of archaeological discoveries has proven 
one of the earliest assumptions of the Wellhausen theory to be wrong. In 1949, CFA Schaefer, quote, found a tablet at Ross Shamra containing 30 letters of the Ugaritic alphabet in their proper order. It was discovered that the sequence of the Ugaritic, that's it, Ugaritic alphabet was at the same time as modern Hebrew, revealing that the modern Hebrew alphabet goes back at least three and a half thousand years. In 1933, J.L. Starkey, who had studied under famed archaeologist Petrie, excavated the city of Lachish, which he prominently, uh, which prominently figured in Joshua's conquest of Canaan. Among other things, and that was one of the things people said, there's no place such as Lachish. All, all these places, not all, a great number of these old cities, they go, there was never a place like that. Never. And we have Bibles. And then archaeologists come up and go, um, that mound of dirt over there, we started moving stuff away. Guess what we found? Evidences. They said there, there was never a King David. Yeah, until archaeology found item after item with David's name inscribed on it, showing that he was the king of Israel. Anyway, I'll get back to this. Among other things, he unearthed pottery, a pottery water pitcher inscribed with a dedication in 11 archaic letters, the earliest Hebrew inscription known. According to Charles Pfeiffer, the Old or Paleo Hebrew script is the form of writing which is like that used by the Phoenicians. A royal inscription of this one king uh, in the alphabet dates from from about 1600 BC. So just to give us a time frame, the, uh, that would be around the time that, that Israel was slaves in Egypt. In 1901-1902, the code of Hammurabi was discovered at an ancient site in Susa, what is now Iran, by a French archaeologist expedition, excuse me, archaeological expedition under the direction of Jacques de Morgan. It was written on a piece of black diorite nearly eight feet high and containing 282 sections. In their book, Archaeology and Bible History, Joseph Free and Howard Voss stated, the Code of Hammurabi was written several hundred years before the time of Moses. So archaeological evidence after archaeological evidence shows over here they had writing, over here they had writing, at the time of Moses, even hundreds of years before Moses. And all the college professors and across the United States said, oops, we apologize, we were wrong. Do you think they did? I don't think they did. I don't think they did for a minute. As early as 1938, respected archaeologist William F. Albright, there's somebody else in discussing various writing systems that existed in the Middle East during the pre-Mosaic times wrote, in this connection it may be said that writing was well known in Palestine and Syria throughout the patriarchal age, that is the mid-Bronze Age from 2100 to 1500 BC. No fewer than five scripts are known to have been in use. Egyptian hieroglyphics, Akkadian cuneiform, the hieroglyphic form of the Phoenicians, a linear alphabet of Sinai, and a cuneiform alphabet of Ugarit. Numerous, numerous archaeological discoveries of the past 100 years have proved once and for all that the art of writing was not only well known in Moses' day, but long before Moses came on the scene. Although skeptics, theological excuse me, liberal theologians, college professors, will continue to perpetuate the document, the documentary hypothesis, this thing that all these people got together and made this up, that it wasn't Moses. They're going to continue to do that. They must be informed or reminded of the fact that one of the foundational assumptions of which they base their theory upon rests that has been shattered by archaeological evidence. Mm -hmm. You see, we don't teach our kids that. 
And to be honest with you, even if they know it, these kids aren't going to go up against these professors and be humiliated in their classes. So they keep their mouths shut. We're going to finish early. All right. So at this point, um, I just want to take a break from the academics. We're finished up with that particular part of the study for tonight. Next week, we will get into internal evidence, and we will also look at the canon of Scripture. The word canon means a standard or a measuring device. Like in, in Paris, in a temperature controlled room, there is a one meter rod. That's a cannon. That is a meter. That, if you want to know any other meter, is an approximation. That particular one is the meter. The meter. That is the one. Okay. Well, that term, the cannon, that that measuring, that standard. We're going to look at that. We're going to look at the standards by which those who determined what books would be included in our Bible, what did they use? Was there a group of people that did this? How, how, how did they come about? Why are certain books in and other books out? We're going to look at that next week. And we're going to begin to look at internal evidence as to what the Bible has to say about itself. But before we go, we do get to actually crack the Bible. So, if you would, if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to Psalm 19. I couldn't resist. <laughs> uh, all right. Did you say 19 or 119? 19. We don't have time for Psalm 119. <laughs> Psalm 19. I'm going to read through this from the English Standard Version. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out throughout all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which carries out excuse me, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving its, his chamber. Like a strong man runs its course with joy. It's rising from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. There is nothing hidden from its heat. Verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock, my redeemer. I want to just, that was a beautiful psalm. I want to point something out that's going to serve us as we go forward. Verses 7 
through 9, we see a number of terms. For those who are not familiar with Hebrew poetry, Hebrew poetry does not have rhymes in the sounds like our poetry does. It's built a couple of different ways. The way that we're seeing here are parallelisms. So it says one thing, there's a, there is a parallelism where it says something in line one, and in line two, it states it this, a little bit different. And then it'll do that again and again and again. There's, there's different types of parallelisms. There's that basic parallelism, and then there's a synthetic <coughs> parallelism where it will build and build and build and build, like it does here, with the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. And the reason I'm pointing this out is to say that in the Word of God, there are times when it says the law, and it's referring to the first five books of the Bible. There are other times where it says the law, it's referring to the books of Deuteronomy and the book of Leviticus. Remember that for a second. Uh, where the law is specific, do this, don't do that. Other times when it says the law, it's talking about the entirety of the Bible. How do we know which one it's referring to? By the context. Okay. So here, we see all these different words, and we, we, could ref we could replace those with the word Bible. Because the Bible is the word of God. The Bible is the law of God. The Bible is the testament. Yes, there are slight nuances in the different words, but I want to read through that again, and I'm going to use the word Bible as we read through it. The Bible of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Actually, let me use the word word. That seems better. The word of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The word of the Lord is right, rejoicing the heart. The word of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The word of the Lord is true and righteous altogether. That's some of the internal evidence about We're going to look at verses like this, passages like this, and find out what does the Bible have to say about itself as we go forward. Do we have any questions? Uh, relevant to what we looked at tonight? Yes, sir? So my biggest hang-up with this book is man interpreted it, copied it, changed it over the years. Who decided that their translation or their copying was that accurate? We have, we're not there yet. When we deal with the canon of Scripture, we will deal with that. Okay. So I'm going to let you hang on that, okay? We absolutely have an answer for that. But I but we need to build the foundation for that, Dan. Instead of just giving you a just giving you a flippant answer, we're gonna build a foundation to that. That's a very, very important question. Yeah, I mean it, okay, my follow-up question then maybe I'll answer this one. <laughs> Why are there so many different Variations or versions, the King James, the NIV, the ESV, the why? Why would there be so I'll give you a simple answer on that. Uh, were you here when we talked about translating something from Spanish to English? Yeah. So let's say that um, there was a car accident. Three people were standing there actually watching the car go down the street when it hit it. So they didn't just notice it after the noise, but they watched it. Right. And they were all native Spanish speakers. Mm -hmm. Okay? They wrote it down in Spanish. Mm -hmm. They're going to write slightly different things. Okay? Yeah. And then we're going to get some people to translate those to English. And we get, let's say that we get three people to translate each one of those three. Okay. Do you think that any if three people taking one document in Spanish and translating it to English is going to be word for word the same? No, and that's my exact point. If it's English, English should be the same. 
if it's Spanish, the Spanish should be the same. Yeah. Yeah. No matter the dialogue or the transition. Right. It can't be. It's just it like if you, if you uh, have uh, three witnesses, but they're all English speaking, mm -hmm. and then the cop comes in and says, okay, tell me what happened. You tell me what happened. You tell me what happened. The cop is going to get three different versions in English, and then he has to write a report to kind of like. That, that example speaks to the Gospels primarily because we have four different Gospels, okay? But if, let's just say we had one person see it. One person saw it, wrote it down, okay? In a language that was different from ours. Now, do you understand Spanish at all? Un poquito. Yeah. The word order is different. What did he say? Okay, water hot. <laughs> Excuse me? Like water is hot, hot water is yeah. backwards. Okay. Right? The word orders are different. So you can't, if you translate it word for word, it doesn't make sense. That's true. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of different All right. And, and, and let me finish, Dan. Some words can be translated a variety of ways. So if I say, like, let's say the word trunk. Okay? What does the word trunk mean? They'll have an elephant's version, and she'll have a book storage version, and somebody, somebody will have the back of their car. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So that's one word that has a variety of different meanings. We determine the correct meaning by context. Okay. We're getting way ahead of ourselves. Okay. This is stuff we're going to look now at. That, we get into study. That'll buy into the context. <laughs> but when we look at stuff, I'll, I'll get some. I'll get some good um, examples. Especially from the Hebrew, okay? Because the Hebrew is so different that if we were to do it liter literally word for word, you wouldn't have a clue what they're talking about. Yeah, I don't even pick up the King James. Hebrew okay. Pictures, right? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's, no, there, there's characters. It's it's not like uh, Chinese, okay? But it's different. So Dan, hang with us. We're gonna lay these things out. We're gonna build a foundation to deal with those things. Yeah, like. I just love a good battle. Um, <laughs> another thing is, like people say, why do we have, why do we have different churches? Why do we have different Bible translations? It's a great question. Okay, did God call us to unity or to uniformity? Right. Which? Unity. So we see things different, and we're free to be the people. I believe that is one thing that gives glory to God, is the fact that we're different. He's given us a free will. We're not all the same. So with that, Dan, would you lead us out? Oh, I'm sorry. I have a question. OK. Um, you know, you were talking about um, professors or whatever saying mm -hmm. that you know they can prove that things weren't written back in the day. Mm -hmm. Uh, but doesn't it say a lot of times in the Bible it was written? Yes. So what does that kind of mean? Generally, the, it is written was from the New Testament uh, times. Okay, I don't um, know. And what they're doing is is they're giving honor to the fact of the written word of God when they say that. Yeah. Even like in the letters in Philippians and stuff? That, that, okay, yeah. sorry. They're, they're, when they say it is written, they're referring to the written word of God which at that time would have been the Old Testament. Okay. 